not as steep as the canyons that you get in Mount Beter. I look at Mount Beter as a little more lush of an area. We are a little more rugged uh, as you get to, up to the top of the Cavedale area where, where uh, Trinity Ridge is and Silver Cloud. You're into big coniferous soils, 2,000 feet elevation, 2,300 feet elevation, similar to what you might get at on, on Howe Mountain, but a little closer to the coast. So it doesn't quite get quite as cold but that elevation creates another different, altogether different terroir, but again, volcanic soils. And then as you drop down to the heart of it in, in Monte Rosa, it is, um, you know, is, to me it was sort of like Mecca, it's like driving into, in, into Hermitage, when you see Hermitage Hill, you're driving to Sonoma Valley, you see Monte Rosa. Uh, it's an incredible, and that's really what drove my passion in making wine um, having made wine with my father since I was when I was 12 years old, but we always kept looking at Monte Rosa and then drinking the old the old wines that Martini made in the 50s that just sort of it blew your mind. Um, and then looking at it, were what is what was called Glen Allen Vineyards, which was sort of a misnomer. Why they called it, who knows? That it was closer to Glen Allen, but is now Moon Mountain Vineyard and then Carmenet Winery. But it was the first big planting on <clears throat> this side in a hundred years, and there there was sixty acres of grapes put in in the in the late sixties, put in by a, a, a commune, the Gurji of commune that I'm sure uh, Jim and Eric will talk about a little bit later. But in, before that, this uh, Jeff Baker and Mac McQuan and a group purchased it, and they started Carmenet. And so in the 60s and in the 70s, late 70s into the 80s, it was the first new winery in the Moon Mountain District. And what the history of that is, with Jeff working at Maya Commas, Mac being involved in, 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 in with, 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 with the financing of Shalom, that that whole revolution that was happening in California with Shalom and Ridge came to Sonoma Valley. And the Carmenet, uh, put it, put out some incredible Cabernets. And that's when Cabernet was really introduced to, uh, as far as I know, into, into Sonoma. Uh, the next planting started a little bit further south in 1983. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet up with Robert Kamen and we developed Kamen Estates Vineyard over the last 35 years. Uh, in between then, there was Hanzel that was planted in 1952 by Zellerbach which is really interesting. And, and this is the, the, the paradox, the, 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 the contradictions that occurred in the development of the California wine business that people thought, well, I'm going to plant Pinot Noir there. And so, you know, I've been into places in Napa Valley where you had Cabernet and Pinot Noir in the same row. So we were learning what the different, what the different appellations were, uh, where the different varietals grew better. But the hands up Pinots that go back to the 50s are just spectacular. And in fact, earlier today, in talking with Jim Antazi, where that he might, might bring it up with a, a letter written about, uh, and this was the late 70s, how Sonoma was getting too warm for Pinot Noir at that point. California was getting too warm for Pinot Noir at that point. But since that time, with Robert coming in, you had mountain terraces started to be planted, Padroni, <coughs> uh, Amapola Creek and, and BYs, there's been a big influx over the last 20, 25, 30 years, and people discovering the types of grapes that we could grow in Moon Mountain District. And um, big, big reds for the most part. Um, you know, the difference I see in Moon Mountain than Mount Beter, like Mount Beter has really steep canyons, really steep ravines, uh, has a different type of soils, doesn't have as much water as we do. We're the dry side of the mountain, they get more rain on the, on the, on the, on the other side. Of, of that artificial, that line of the Valley Napa from Sonoma. Uh, but we have that Western, Southwestern exposure that creates the flavors that you'll taste today. Yeah, I mean, wow, what a great overview. <laughs> Every time I listen to you talk, I feel like I'm in school. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't make a very good teacher. They could, they could look at my kids. <laughs> I didn't make a very good student. Um, you, you know, and, and so there's a real passion and, and beauty when you work in the hillside vineyards uh, that, and it, it takes 
Um, I remember having this conversation with, with Jeff Baker, the, the characters that, you know, if you think about not the Mount Vitor side with Maya Thomas in the 1890s, there were characters that, 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 that left San Francisco to get as far away, to get away from the plague. And maybe that's why we're all hiding, hiding out up here in, in Moon Mountain District to get rid of this, to get away from this uh, COVID-19. There's a little similarity to what happened in the 1800s there. So a lot of a lot of a lot of great individuals in this mountain range. Yeah, interesting times. Well, for sure. I mean, obviously, making wines in mountains is very difficult. Your yields are naturally lower. The terrain is very rugged. I mean, when you go up to some of these places that have, were planted a long time ago, like Monterosso, you wonder, well, how did they possibly deal with this place 130 years ago? You know? Well, especially now when in a lot of these places where we're doing redevelopment and we come across these rocks the, the, the size of, 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 of pickup trucks and they worked around, worked around them. They didn't have the horsepower that we have now. Uh, they didn't have, and everything at that point was, was, was dry farmed. The climate definitely was a little bit different. Um, there's a lot of places in the Moon Mountain District that probably couldn't have been, couldn't have been dry farmed in the 1860s, 1890s, but with, with wells and stuff, we're able to, uh, to 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 maintain and deal with the heat that we start that we have, okay, and, and develop rugged rocky hillsides. All right, that's I mean that's a, it's fascinating. So I mean it's like a, it's like almost eight thirty here in New York. It's five thirty in California. I think it's time to taste some wine. Um, if everybody's okay with that, uh, we have six wines. And so what I thought would be fun to do is you know we've got this map, and I think what we'll do is we'll just follow the order of the map. So we might as well continue um, and just sort of start with Valley House, which you call on your, I'm gonna show the, um, the bottle. People always say I don't hold them up, the bottles up long enough. So I'm gonna hold it up for an artificially long period of time. This is the wine that you call Simon's that is from the vineyard called Valley House. So maybe we start with your wine and then we'll, we'll move through the map clockwise and we'll wrap up, we'll, we'll, that'll take us all the way to Cayman Estate, which I'm sure is gonna be a, a very fun. But tell us a little bit about, um, Tell us a little bit about this particular site why you, and why you work for it for your label. Okay, uh, you know, it's interesting. Here we are talking about a, a Moon Mountain district and a vineyard that's called Valley House Vineyard. And whenever you're dealing with a mountain AVA like this and hillside vineyards, that you are gonna have canyons. Uh, you're, you're gonna have areas that are more of a, more of a valley. That whole area where the Moon Mountain District, if you could point it out where Simons is, if you could point it out on the, on the map, Antonio, yeah. it's, a, it's a caldera behind Monte Rosa. And it's about, it's at a, a little bit less than a thousand foot elevation, about 870. Uh, and it's down in a little bit of a hole. Uh, and you can see that there's a depression there and the, with the pond and a real rocky, there is not a lot of soil all, all the vineyards that that we farm, that I farm are all certified organic, and I like to break make soil with using cover crops and stuff to, to really express the terroir of the region. Um, this was this is was planted originally uh, in, in the 90s, uh, and then was replanted in 2010 uh, after Nut and Laura Simons brought the, bought the property, and they have a house further up in the ridges, the hill house where we have a little vineyard at. And this valley house, it's interesting because I could drive there from from my place to Robert Cayman's and you drop down in the morning and that's what, instead of having a cup of coffee, I just open up the windows of my truck or on my ATV because it's colder. The cold air settles in that spot. So, and if you look at the harvest date in uh, for the 2016 uh, that we were pouring, um, the, the, the harvest date, was September 28th. 2016 was a drought year, a hot, warm year. Everything came in earlier. Uh, other vineyards that are harvested at that time were harvested mid, the beginning of the beginning of, of, of September. Uh, and was what I planted here, it's, it's all in 110R and 1103 P rootstock. And I used all Ontov clones, uh, which are, that, that are made up of 337-169, Clone 15 and, three, and a little bit of 338. Um, but real, real, uh, real, there's a lot of minerality that's expressed in this wine. And if you walk through it, um, 
not too dis if you go to shop enough you have round rocks you come to the moon mountain district you have sharp jagged basaltic rocks that uh, uh are a little harder on your feet <laughs> <laughs> and well, mainly because this whole area and, and the same thing with with the, the cayman vineyards was just running to it were were volcanic eruptions that were done underwater at the time and so when the when the, when the lava came out and cooled quickly got really brittle and fragile and and well and, and, and in hawaii they called ah uh -uh. there's a type of, of volcanic rock that it is yeah this I mean, it's a fascinating discussion um i i opened this wine maybe uh an hour hour and a half ago it was so closed i thought my god this wine is just unbelievably hard and unyielding and now it's just absolutely beautiful right. and when he's, I, I promise you I'll move this label a little bit because now that I see the map blown up like this, I realize that this, the name Valley House, it might obscure some part of the, the topography that we want to show so that we can render the site really as it is, you know, which is that kind of, as you described, the sort of lower altitude within a mountain region. So we'll move yeah, that and, a little bit. And, and, you know, I always like to joke, we're, we're looking for little cooler sites in warm, in warm areas, you know. Because uh, as we deal with, with with climate change and heat spikes, it's nice to be have a little bit of protection. But that's the beauty of again a mountain hillside vineyard, where as as the, as the farmer, I try to create uniformity out of chaos, and because there's there's no there's there's nothing uniform about any of these vineyards up here because of, of the slopes and aspects. But that's that creates the tension that's within the wine. Yeah, the wine definitely has a lot of mineral minerality and tension. And you mentioned something that I think is really important that I'm sure we'll talk about. A couple of things we'll talk about, I'm sure, later with as we bring in some of your colleagues and some of the other vintners. But climate change is obviously a big issue. And, you know, driving some of these roads, I mean, you have to be maybe a little bit adventurous. But, you know, if you have an opportunity to go see these places, there's really no I mean, they're not accessible you know, as like places are in, in many parts of Sonoma or, or Napa and there's no tasting rooms or anything, but boy, I, it's just so beautiful to just, sometimes I just like to drive just to, just to drive around and just to see the places. It's really well, you inspiring. Know, you know, what's interesting is, is from, from, you know, I live right above where it says Couturier Estates and farming to Moon Mountain Vineyards or Silver Cloud. You know, it's less than a mile as the crow flies a mile and a half and it'll take me half hour to 45 minutes to drive there. I, I do yeah. have some backwoods ATV trails, but uh, I, I can't do that. For, uh, for non-combatants. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thank um, you. Fantastic, Phil. Thanks so much for that. Um, why don't we, um, we'll, we'll, I mean, this is great. You can see, I mean, I think you guys, are, I'm sharing my screen so you guys can see the questions. There's a ton of questions, but I think we'll, we'll save those to the end so we can make sure that we can get a really great description from each of the vintners. So next up is, is Brian. Uh, here's your vineyard, which where we did a tasting like this about a year ago, as you remember. Yep. Uh, go it. So uh -huh. Folks can see, let's see how coordinated I am. But uh, it's here. Let's see here. Here at the bottom, I'm gonna do this, but you're here and here so how would you what, what inspired you to make wine from this i mean you could have made wine anywhere why here well phil did a heck of a good job i in explaining what uh, moon mountain's all about and the terrain what drew me here was i'd spent a lot of time in italy and i was moving into a second phase of living from um working in offices and I was looking for something that reminded me of being in Italy and being able to invite good friends and not have them to fly across the ocean to come see me. So when I started looking for a property, I first started looking for a property that kind of reminded me of being in Italy. And I think Moon Mountain area reflects that in many ways, in many aspects. So that was what kind of finally drew me here. I looked at a lot of different things, but, um, Cayman's movie of uh, Walk in the Clouds when I drove in here on a on a foggy morning absolutely took me to another dimension of of what I was trying to do, which is to create a more romantic lifestyle and start another phase and, and make wine. And so 
I started becoming interested in this property. It had no road into it, no electricity. It had never been lived on. It had been landlocked because there was no right of way. So it was a real piece of land that I could develop much like my dad did back in 1945 in, in Washington. And so it intrigued me from a number of different points of view, but the feeling that it had. So then I started really looking at, okay, I knew very little about wine other than drinking a lot of wine. And I started exploring around the area and talking to people and the fact that it was tucked up right up against Mono Rosso, I started drinking some of the wines off of Mono Rosso that were developed. And I thought, how much better could I be not knowing what I, you know, that I know now, but what I didn't know then, it allowed me to make a, a jump into it to believe that great wine could be made off of it because it, it had never been farmed. It, it was all highland pastures that were developed in the 50s and they brought a bulldozer in and flattened them and, and raised pastures on them. And so there was a little bit of clearing to do, but a lot of it was already cleared and terraced and, and it was absolutely beautiful. So from there, it's been a real process of of learning from people like Phil and others. And, and I've made my share of mistakes, but the one thing that I did do a little different is I planted a lot of different rootstocks and a lot of different clones in Cabernet and slowly we learn which ones produce a better bottle of wine than others. And so I've been willing to change uh, change rootstocks, change clones, change row directions. So it's, it's trying to uh, compress a hundred years of learning into a, into a short period of time. And, and we're still doing it. We're, we're still learning more each time and talking to people like Phil who really know what they're doing and, and taking advice from others. I think we continue to try to bring grapes forward that really express what Moon Mountain is. And that's kind of, that's my drive is, is how do we, how do we get the right grapes for the winemaker to make a great bottle of wine? What does he need? I mean, from, from the aromatics to the tannins and the, and, and the one advantage here, I think, is you get so many different slope directions, um, different, and we, we have land that's facing east and we have land facing west and we have south and north and different slopes and, and everything from white ash to red ash. So there's so much, it's almost like a, um, a farm being raised by more for experimentation than it is for wine itself. So it's been really a fun project for me. Growing up in Washington, my dad was, my grandfather and my dad and my uncles were all grafters. So I grew up budding and grafting and, and we raised all kinds of apples. And every time a new apple come out, we made that apple. So it's been able to extend my whole period of childhood growing. Well, you know, I remember when I came out to your place last year, we took a walk around the vineyard and you showed us these two blocks in red. Um, maybe you could tell our, the folks watching, what is it about these two parcels that are distinctive? Because this is what you use for your wine. Oh, I kind of, I think I did a pretty good job on that label. It's pretty artistic. The, the, um, that particular vineyard is one of the vineyards that, um, slopes to the northwest which is i think a, you know it gets a good afternoon sun but it's all red ash and and phil you can come in on this but from my point of view we get more aromatics off of that particular vineyard than off of the white ash which i think i find it a little more mineral driven so it, it i think they taste different though the clones on both different uh, blocks do taste different. So it was a, um, you know, we didn't know where the best wines would come from. We, we planted one acre parcels on 20 different spots. And, you know, we had no clue of where the best grapes would be grown. And it's only over a farming period that we've, we've learned each block and what it, how to raise it and how much water to give it. We've gone to, you know, water probes that measure water so that we're not just looking at the leaves themselves, we're also looking at the content of the water in the soils to try to improve watering. So it's been a real kind of learning process, but that particular block in red ash produces a great, great flavor. 
Well, those those red soils that we get on on Moon Mountain uh, do have a nice clay content to them, and and so that organic matter in there does adds a little bit of softness to the wines. Okay, so when, so this wine is a little bit you know compared to to your wine, Phil. So this this one is a little bit lusher, a little bit creamier, a little more dense. Is that are we tasting an ex at more the place that's like that, or is it more a choice to make that wine that's a little bit more lush in its kind of approach? Uh, you know, place comes through uh, uh, all these wines. I, I think you'll see a sense of place in every wine that we'll drink here. Uh, you know, the, the, the lack of the rock that. <laughs> the, that, that's the beauty of, of of the Moon Mountain District is you get a sense of place. Yeah. And, and then as a dog is out looking for his place. Yeah. yeah so it's a, so for you know as 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 folks um, are tasting the wines alongside us, um, yeah, there's definitely kind of a richer, creamier, more textured. Um, an expression of of place which i think is fantastic i mean i remember that from 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 last year when we had we did a similar tasting like this as i said why don't we why don't we move over to moon mountain vineyard i, I, I love this map i mean alessandro our cartographer i mean i just think he did an unbelievable job here um i don't want to blow this up here because uh, you know the really complex sites i think they're just they're just stunning to look at the detail here that he's depicted. All these blocks, all the different names. So here's, these are the blocks you can see here. And then we move here, we can get sort of context of where we are. So let's, um, yeah, let's, let's move on to, move to Moon Mountain Vineyard. Who wants to? Who wants to kick us off? Tell us about the about the vineyard and what is unique about it. You can see it's right above Monte Rosso and right next to Ledson's Mountain Terraces. Yeah, Antonio, I'll start. This is Jim, um, yeah. and then maybe Eric can jump in. But uh, I'll, I'll maybe tell a little bit of how this all came to be and tie it up into Phil's narrative at the beginning. You mentioned a little bit of the history. I'll maybe flush that out a bit, but. Um, there's sort of the archetypal story of someone who had this lifelong dream to buy a vineyard and went on this long search. And I'm probably the absolute opposite of that, where it was effectively an impulse buy, um, and a wonderful impulse, but kind of an impulse buy. Um, the story very, very briefly is I was sitting on my couch playing guitar, uh, drinking a bottle of wine, and I barked out to my wife, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were in Sonoma on a porch looking at a vineyard with me playing my guitar, looking at a vineyard. Um, and within days we were in our car and stomping around dirt, looking at, at properties. And 10 months later we were under contract and, and I bought this place. Um, what happened in between, I guess, is probably what's most interesting. Uh, number one, Phil took me on an absolutely unsanctioned, unauthorized, illicit vineyard tour on ATVs and wove his magic about all the great things that could be done. Um, which we're still working on, but I, I believed him and I still do. Um, the other thing I did is I educated myself about the history and really dug deep into it all, which is, and it would take too long to flush that all out, but I, I traced down all the, some of the old bottles of Carmenet wine that, that Jeff had made many years ago, was just absolutely blown away how well they had aged. Um, I then traced it even further back and found a bunch of the old Glen Ellen Vineyard wines that, uh, uh, Richard Arrowwood had made at Chateau St. Jean and that Ridge had made and Kistler had made. Um, those go back to the mid seventies and late seventies. And those also had aged wonderfully. And it tied, I think very neatly into what I like in wine and what I value in wine, which is freshness and balance and ageability. And, and then I learned how conducive this part of the world is and this vineyard site is to making wines like that. So long story short, I, I pulled the trigger. Um, it's been a, uh, 10 years of hard work, but really fun work. Um, the vineyard's gone from seven to 15 different grape varieties as we learn about what grows well where. Um, 
you know, the name and it's good. This vineyard has gone through a series of names and it's made wine under a series of name. We, uh, repris was, uh, which is a French word meaning revival or rebirth, which is kind of a loose translation was leveraging sort of that history and what we were trying to do to kind of bring that history back, back to life. Um, so that's kind of the big picture that the goal is to keep learning and getting better. And I think the wines are getting better every year. Um, I bring a long-term multi-generational lens to what we're doing. And uh, I had this crazy vision when I bought it 10 years ago that I would be around for 50 harvests. I'm 10 into it. This will be the 10th. Um, so I'm hoping I got 40 more good ones in me. So uh, I don't know, Eric, anything you want to add to that? No, thanks, Jim. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the vineyard itself and, and how at least Phil and I you know, approach it in any given harvest. Um, it, we have an unusual ability in my experience, and I've made wine out of, I think, 17 different vineyards in this AVA over the last 22 vintages. Uh, you know, I started working at Arrowwood back in 2000, where we were getting Monterosso fruit and Mountain Terraces fruit, and then spent close to 10 years working at the Mountain Terraces Vineyard for another label before Jim came and bought this and uh, convinced me to come do this with him and with Phil. Um, and this is a really unique site. We're able to maintain acidity um, at high levels of ripeness or tannin ripeness. Um, and I, I give a lot of credit to Phil and his ability to, to build strength into these sites that are really, you know, naturally very severe and highly stressed. Um, I had farmed next door at what's now Ledson Mountain Terraces, basically hydroponically from 2002 through 2010. The only tool that I had to keep the grapes or keep the vines viable after, you know, call it the beginning of July, was by watering everything every three or four days. Uh, as soon as I turned it off, the vines would shut down. That's not really the case here. Um, we've got some Zinfandel that was planted back in 69 that's completely dry farmed. We don't even have um, the ability to irrigate it if we wanted to. Uh, and most of the, the different blocks might hit or might get hit by irrigation three or four times the entire summer and fall as opposed to you know twice a week well you know really part part of that <clears throat> is the dedication and, and for my uh that my clients have given to organic farming and you know with growing zinfandel dry farmed in a mountain vineyard like this large buried variety can withstand the heat cabernet is another little uh little bit of a quest to dry farm because of of the berry size and but the our goal in all these projects, and I'm speaking for everybody that's here, if we could dry farm up to Verasion and then use water sparingly to get it through harvest, it's like running a marathon, and that's what growing great grapes is is running a marathon. Yeah, and yeah. It's so because this, oh, sorry, I just want to say this is the, this is the wine reprise, so it might be helpful, I think, for folks watching. Jim or Eric, if you could describe the, the, the vineyard is Moon Mountain, but the brand is Repri. Is it the same ownership or is it two different things entirely that we should be thinking about? Yeah, it's the same ownership. I mean, that was, uh, and it's probably unduly complex, but I wanted to preserve the history of it being, you know, it had been called the Glen Ellen Vineyard until it renamed itself, but the Moon Mountain Vineyard had been around a long, long time. Um, I wanted a new start to the winery. So it's, uh, Moon Mountain Vineyard and Repri are one and the same, but uh, one's, one is the name of the vineyard and one is the name of the wine. Okay. And so here's the, the Repri wine, um, which is called Left Bank. Um, but it, it's really interesting because this wine has 40% Cabernet Franc, which is not a grape that you tend to see so often in the Moon Mountain District. So I'm just curious what the, so this is, a, it's a, if I'm reading the back here, it's 60, I'm going to put it up here. I'm not sure if people can see, but it's 60 Cab Sauvignon, 40% Cabernet Franc. So where does the inspiration come for Cabernet Franc in Moon Mountain, given that it's not necessarily the most common variety? Um, we actually have, you know, a little over 10 acres planted 
on this site to Cabernet Franc at a couple of different elevations. Um, if you can zoom down to your D'Alessandro's depiction of the vineyard itself, the block, you'll see <laughs> there's one block that's named the football block that is on our northern edge, sits at around 1400 feet at the top. And it's got these purple soils. Um, and we have a unique thing going on there where I can, I can get Cabernet Franc nice and ripe. Um, pyrazines get polymerized and sweetened up. Tannins are, are plush, but the alcohols are in balance and the acidity is, is tense. So I can end up with pHs, natural pHs, and in this wine, that's about 3.6 which makes it very stable and age-worthy and fresh. Um, we also have Cabernet Franc in our feather block, which is our kind of highest elevation block, around 1,700 feet. And, you know, I don't have quite as much acidity up there, but it's still fairly unusual, as you know, to be able to get Cabernet Franc ripe to a point where it's pleasurable without it being a little bit, you know, flabby and losing its shape. That's the big challenge. And our proximity to the Petaluma Gap, combined with Phil's farming, our volcanic soils, and our altitude, it, it's, a, it's just a really cool cocktail that comes together. So Repri, you know, really, if you boil it down, I think, is an exposition of Cabernet Franc. So we do this, which we call our left bank, Cab and Cab Franc. We do a right bank that is Merlot and Cab Franc. We do a straight Cab Franc. I use the same Cab Franc in all three bottlings so you can really see how, it, how it's affected when it's blended with its brethren. And you can also see what it's like on its own. And then we do, in our highest end bottling is, is all three together. And sometimes even, even Petit Verdot and Malbec go in there as well. So um, it, it's just a, it's a fun place to make wine. It's a big puzzle. As Phil alluded to earlier, and, and as Jim did as well, you know, Jeff Baker um, really left me a, a legacy of, of notes from experiments that he ran back in the 80s and the 90s that we look at all the time uh, as inspiration to try and figure out how to solve the next layer to the puzzle. But um, all the... Yeah, Cabernet Franc is the story here, and it, it's surprising to a lot of people, but it keeps it very interesting for me. Yeah, so one question before we move on to Trinity Ridge. When you make a, a, a wine that's blended like this, where the percentages of both varieties are pretty high, do you prefer to age the blended wine like pretty much from the beginning, or do you like to age the components separately and then do your blend at the very end? Um, I tend to age them separately. They never ripen at the same time. So I'll usually blend in the springtime before I bottle. So, and then I'll put the blends together physically and let them marry for the last three or four months before bottling. Okay. I'm just curious, um, Eric, what, what elevation um, is, is the cup from? Is it a, a couple different ones or? It's a couple different ones. So the football block mark is around, you know, 13, 1400 feet at the top of it. And then feather is the very top of the property. So you're up over 1700 feet. So the Cap Franc at Cayman is about um, 1100 feet. So I'm just trying to figure out the juxtaposition. Interesting. Thank you. Well, and you know, what's really, you know, we do owe it to Jeff. Jeff Baker brought in all these clones from Caldwell when, when Carmenet was being developed. And, it, you know, we, weren't, we didn't know a lot about viruses at that time, but we were dealing with unvirused fruit and uh, these on top clones that had flavors that, uh, you know, that you get really good ripeness that comes from carbohydrate production, not dehydration, because there's no red leaves out there. And Cab Franc, Grown to me is is a really seductive grapevine and a really seductive wine, and it's great to find a place where you could grow it like this. Yeah, we're talking Caldwell from Coombsville, correct? We're talking John Caldwell from Coombsville, the old smuggler. Exactly. All right, cool. Um, why don't we go? Uh, we have a, a sort of a it's an interesting set of wines because now we're going to taste Syrah, 
but let's go to Lassiter. John and Nancy Lassiter and Tony Biaggi, their winemaker, are on the on the call with us. Let's see if I'm capable of showing this. Well, here's the here's the vineyard. Um, one of the comments, um, the Q and A, is that people can't read the map. So I'm going to try to blow it up as big as possible. But here's Lassiter. Trinity Ridge, and you're right in the center of the screen. And um, well, I'd love to hear from John and Nancy how they, what, because you, you own various properties in the region. So what attracted you to this piece of land and what's your vision for it? Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm John Lasseter, my wife, Nancy Lasseter. And one of the things that um, attracted us to Sonoma and Sonoma Valley is the people. The people in this valley are amazing and the people that you have on this call, it's, it's so exciting to have all these amazing people because they are so giving. Uh, Nancy and I came to Sonoma Valley in 1993 <clears throat> and started making wine right away with an amateur winemaking group. And in 2000, we started our winery, bought our first property on the Glen Ellen bench and we started making the wines that we love to drink as we traveled through Europe. And it's the blended wines. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to try to do blended wines with, with California fruit? And got connected to Phil Couture right away and helping us grow and make world-class vineyards on the Glen Allen bench. But we had a desire to get mountain fruit. Phil Couture is a great salesman. It may not look like it, but man, is that guy a great salesman. He kept saying, mountain fruit, John and Nancy, mountain fruit, John and Nancy, mountain fruit. And we went, okay, Phil, come on, show us some, some, some places. And so this wonderful vineyard that we have called Trinity Ridge was planted by Phil Katuri, and it has two parcels to it. Now, mountain fruit is something very special to us because one of our dearest friends, the great vintner, Jess Jackson, Talk to us at length about what is special about mountain fruit. And right here in our own home, we have one of the greatest, greatest areas for mountain fruit, the Moon Mountain District, because of its volcanic soils, because of its altitude, because of its angle to the sun. And each, each of the vineyards that you're seeing is so unique and so special, have commonality, but are very different. Even within our Trinity Ridge, we have two parcels. Um, one, we have a, our Cabernet Sauvignon on. We have some Sauvignon Blanc, the Bordeaux varietals. But right now, everybody, halfway through our tasting, we're going to take you to Rhone for a little Syrah. <laughs> it's a get, little Rhone break. Get your palates ready. It's hard to switch from Cap to the Syrah. Yeah, take, take a sip. Let it swirl and around in your mouth. Don't judge it until after a few sips. <laughs> but we are so proud of this Syrah. We do a lot of Rhone varietals. We love our Grenache. We love our Movedra. We love our Cunois, Cinso, and our Syrah. But the Syrah that's on this property, when we started making it, and our first, um, first vintage of two, uh, 2017, we were able to pull this in before the fires. This came into our winery before the fires. We lost 30% of all of our fruit due, due to the fires and the smoke taint. Uh, but this, we saw right away was something special. We originally had the idea that we were gonna put this into our European style blends. But after tasting this, this single uh, vintage of this single varietal, we decided no. This has to go out to the world as a single varietal bottling. And it started a whole new line for us at the Lasseter Family Winery of our single varietals from this vineyard, Trinity Ridge. And this is a very special uh, vineyard. One of the things that is so, that, that we enjoy so much about our home property is that, that it's quite hot, but the diurnals, meaning the temperature at night versus the temperature during the day is so great because we are kind of lower. What's fascinating, everybody thinks mountain fruit, ah, it's gonna be cooler up there. No, because the coolness of the night drops to, to uh, the lower sections or the bowls. And it's fascinating that actually the fruit up here 
stays warmer at night. It keeps ripening through the night. Whereas on, on our home property, it's like you're taking the fruit and putting it in the refrigerator every night. It's one of the great things is why we have such long growing seasons here. It's so spectacular. But this mountain fruit being at like 1700 um, elevation, it's the volcanic soils that are so special about the Moon Mountain District. But it's also the, this, this really special quality that, that it actually stays warm, but, but a delicate warmness to it. This Syrah is on a, a, a we're in a bowl and it's an, actually a north facing uh, vineyard. And it's, it's actually very, um, a very different personality than, than the other part of our vineyard, which is the, the Cabernet Sauvignon. It's like, we have five sons. It's the same gene pool, but they're so different. <laughs> well, it's the same thing here. We have two vineyards and they are so different. The personalities of these vineyards are so incredibly different. And, and this one is so special for the Syrah. It's like the Northern Rhone area, like an Hermitage. You know, it is, it, it's so special. And we are, we are really proud of this wine and of this vineyard. Phil Katuri, um farms it for us. But I want to hand it over to um, our dear friend, Tony Biaggi, who is our, our consulting winemaker. He has is, is, is really helped us take this and discover how special the fruit is that's coming off of and, this vineyard. And, and he helped us to bring out the characteristics of the bridal in the terroir and uh, let it let it sing and now, what we knew we were going to leave this to be a single bridal. Now um, Tony is from Napa but don't judge him harshly everybody. <laughs> don't judge him harshly. He's actually a really great guy. We love him and he comes over the hill to Sonoma where he makes amazing wine for us. Tony take it away. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey, I'm at Phil in Napa, though. So just because Phil, um, am I here? Antonio, am I on? Yeah, you bet. I hear you. OK, yeah, I never know. I, I have my mute, I have my mic muted all day. I met Phil in Napa, so I can't say that. But I mean, the funny thing about the straw is, and I think John and Nancy would agree, I mean, one of the silver linings of 17, there's not many of the, of the fires throughout Sonoma Valley was um, the fact that this straw was probably destined for the GS, for our uh, Chemin de Fer, if we didn't, if we didn't bottle this, you know, but because the Grenache was the last thing hanging, and Phil, you can attest to this too, uh, we were able to keep it separate, and, you know, this, you know, at the time, Syrah was planted for, for your uh, GSM, the uh, Chemin de Fer, so, but we, we attacked it with, with, with stems, and, I'm a big fan of, of Cote Rotiva, but more of GMA style, not, not the Viognier added of, of Cote Rotiva, but more of the GMA 100% whole cluster. So this one was about 30% whole cluster. It went to 100% new wood at the time because we were gonna blend with it. And then in the end, it worked really well. I would probably say in hindsight, I would probably go differently. But if you look at the map, Antonio, yeah. the 1700 feet elevation, that's, pure, that's sheer cliff. I mean, that, that's straight up and down. Now, if you go down below where the Syrah is, that's almost a tabletop. It's almost flat. And that's where the Syrah is right there. Um, 17 was a very low yielding uh, year for us. We probably averaged about 1.2 to 1.3 tons per acre off that block. Uh, we were waiting for a lot more, Phil, thanks. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> don't know what happened. Um, it, it got we ripe though. Waiting so for it. We're still waiting for it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, because of that, the, the fruit was so intense and so rich, the clonal material is beautiful. And I do think because of the diurnal shift, Mountain Syrah is very rare. I mean, you don't see much of it right now. While you're here. So being able to work with Syrah at elevation is pretty cool. Um, you get a lot of classic sort of colder climate Syrah characteristics. Syrah often can run uh, good red wine disease, where it just tastes like really ripe red wine. It's really good, but you don't really know what it tastes like. I think with this Syrah, with air, you get a lot of sort of the beef, the, sort of the beefiness. The, um, the, I always say smoked bacon fat, the bacon fat effects of it, the herbalness, which I really love. So I mean, it's a great site for Syrah, and, and we're really enjoying now fooling around with it. Danielle, who is the true winemaker, she's just had a baby, so she couldn't be here tonight. Um, so everybody cheer her on for having a, a little baby boy. Um, but we love working with this fruit, I and mean, this is really exciting stuff. So... 
Yeah, I mean, I why did you plant Syrah there? You know, the, um, the, that's the beauty of, of, of the Moon Mountain District. There's areas that, you, that aren't great for Cabernet, and you have, but you could produce great red wines. And even, you know, there, within the Moon Mountain District, there's some Chardonnay, as, as you know, Tony, because you make some from Vineyard up next to Kistler. I do. Uh, you know, the slope aspect, elevation, g g allows you to have, have fun and not just grow Cabernet. You know, I love Cabernet, but when you have a spot like this that you can, you can pull off a Cabernet, uh, excuse me, a Syrah that has the intensity of this, it's always fun to have that there because it, uh, you know, encourages biodiversity. Perfect. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great site. I mean, I wish we could pour the Cabernet. I mean, the block Antonio that's underneath the 1700 feet is due. I mean, that whole site, I mean, you have different aspects that run that whole site. That block is due west. I mean, it, it, you can almost see the ocean from there. I think you can. Phil says I'm crazy. But um, <laughs> um, I, I, it's just a really stunning site. And I wish there was more acreage there. Um, I think we all do. You know, every you find a great site. But there's some fun wines coming off that property. Sauvignon Blanc, too. And that's one thing that I'd love to talk about. We do grow Sauvignon Blanc up there, too. Mountain Sauvignon Blanc, a rarity in California. Um, you know, Eric and I are sort of geek out about that stuff. But uh, Mountain Sauvignon Blanc is pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's a beautiful wine. I, you know, it's funny. I, I've stopped using the word smoke when I describe wines because I think it conjures up yeah. things that maybe are suggestive of something that's, you know. Well, they, the, they the, don't like that. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. the, wine, the wine that was made after the fires, um, you know, I was excited thinking, oh, maybe we could use it for barbecue sauce or has that hickory <laughs> smoke thing. No, it was like licking an ashtray. It was. Not it was <laughs> disgusting. Not so, sure why we even picked it. So smoke is good, Antonio. Ashtray is not good in a descriptor. <laughs> I wouldn't when even. You say smoke though, there's that. a little bit of PTSD that comes into play. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, so don't don't worry. I would I wouldn't ask you. I wouldn't even know it's, how to use it. But that's um, a fascinating wine, and it's I think it's wonderful that we have. This diversity, you know, we've had a couple of Cabernets, had a wine with strong Cabernet Franc imprint, we had a, obviously a Syrah, um, and now we're going to move on to the Edge, and we've got Mac, and uh, just love to hear your, obviously because you have a lot of experience in the area, your perspective, I and mean, look at the, for everybody, you know, on the call, you can see where we've moved into a, a different part of the, of the area, of the region of Moon Mountain, and I would just love to hear from you what it is about this site that attracted you here. You also have a quite, quite, a, quite a, a nice mix of varieties, but what is it about this property that really excited you? Why don't we start with you, Mac? Well, uh, I, I have to turn over the comments about the wine to Jeff. And I'll just yeah. pr provide a couple of comments about how we got started. Uh, which was, exactly. we started it as, as in, essence, in essence, as Glen Ellen Vineyard in 1980. And uh, I had been working with Dick Graff uh, down, in, down at Shalom for the prior decade. And uh, we were, of course, that's Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and so forth. But I think the overall conclusion that I'd arrived at uh, from studying the subject was that Cabernet uh, in, the, in the North Coast, at least, was uh, one of the most important alternatives. And the quality of wine made from Cabernet fundamentally with other, other uh, additives at other wines from the Bordeaux area that were emerging from Bordeaux pretty much uh, told the story. So my partner and I, a uh, financial partner and I, found Glen Ellen Vineyard. We enticed three other guys into buying it. And my partner was a, a former classmate of Jeff's uh, at Stanford. And, and Jeff had been making wine at Mayakamas and had uh, emerged from Davis some years before that. But uh, we, we started to work on, I think there was, I don't know how many, Phil can tell you how many acres of vines there were when we started uh, Carmenet. I think there's 60 some up there now. Yeah. And when we first started, I think there was like six so we, we've, and we drilled uh, into the mountain to produce caves from volcanic ash. 
which proved to be an extremely good place to age wine, make wine and age wine. But I think in terms of commenting about uh, the blends and so forth, uh, we actually have two vineyards over cloud up in the mountains, up around 1800 feet. And Stone Edge Farm itself is uh, on west of the town of Sonoma, about 10 minutes in elevations between 120 and 170 feet. Uh, but I'd like to have Jeff uh, take over and comment about the wine. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to show you this wine. I'm going to show everybody watching this this uh, label. Hopefully, I can do this properly. But this is this is uh, your wine. It's 2015. It's 87% Cabernet, 13 13 percent Cabernet Franc. Um, I think this wine is a, just a knockout. The aromatics are just absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's really rich, but not too much. And uh, yeah, it would be great to hear kind of the philosophy about making this wine on this property. And, and you know, if I may interject, you know, working with Mac, uh, his dedication uh, from, from Carmenet to the, to the Silver Cloud Stone Edge properties uh, is, is very visionary. Uh, he embraced my approach to organic farming years ago. Uh, he's really dedicated his life to sustainable energy uh, and it, it, it shows, again, that sense of place and uniqueness of the individuals that work up in the Moon Mountain District. And, and Jeff, somewhere lost in Idaho, I think. Oh, no, I'm right here. <laughs> Can you, <clears throat> I think my speaker's on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Oh, good, good. Yeah, so we um, bought this vineyard, um, hmm. well, I think about eight years ago now. But we were, I was particularly looking for getting into the higher elevation, cooler parts of, uh, of the Appalachian, looking at global warming coming up. Uh, I'd like to have, be able to cover your bases in all kinds of different years. So we have, we source grapes from other Moon Mountain District uh, vineyards a little bit, although this is our predominant one right, right here now. And it's up at 1900 feet, which back in the 80s, <laughs> when you go back to that, I don't think you could have begun to ripen Cabernet up there. Um, and, but now um, with the clones we have and with the clean grape for um, clean uh, stock without virus, we're, we're able to do that. This pushes the ripening really late. We're usually ripening about the end of uh, October. And uh, that also helps spread out <laughs> the wines com com uh, coming into the winery. We're, we're a tiny winery, but we have, we make 25 or 30 different lots each year. This particular vineyard, um, it's complex. It's, it's up near the ridge. The geologists say it was part of an old landslide where the whole side of the mountain slid off. So it's a tumbling jumble of different soil types. Um, and we actually have 15 different tracked blocks in a 16 acre vineyard. So um, there's a lot of complexity there. I know we usually get around to talking about the complexity of these sites and all the Moon Mountain vineyards. And I've, I've, I've loved working with them. I actually started at Maya Kamas in the 70s, which is right on top of the ridge, not too far from here, but only less than a mile from the uh, count, count, county line, got fascinated with the mountain fruit and uh, its potential. But the other thing is the mountains beat you up. I mean, you're, you're in rocks, you're walking up and down steep slopes. And after a while, when you work that hard at something, you get really attached and you love it all the more. And so I, I fell in love with these mountains in the seventies and I've been up here ever since. And um, being able to develop this vineyard, it was planted in 99. Uh, we, we didn't plant it and there were plenty of mistakes made and we've learned a lot since then. And over the next, the last several years, we've ended up re replanting the whole vineyard based on Phil's experience, our experience with the um, modern, the best ways to farm grapes. It's all organically farmed. It's farmed by Phil. I don't make any wines from grapes that aren't farmed by Phil. I'm kind of uh, stuck in a rut there, but 
He but, makes uh, winemaking easy. Basically, if you have great grapes, all you can do with winemaking is try not to screw it up. Um, if you have problem grapes, you really have to make wine in a sense. You have to use all your knowledge and tricks, but uh, Phil makes it easy. We bring in these fabulous, fabulous grapes and we can select just the lots we want for our, our top of the line flagship estate and still have one lots left to put into our secondary wine, which is called Surround. Um, this property has an interesting hand that it, it was the um, um, boxing camp. So there weren't any grapes up there then, but he and horses, it probably took them all day to get up there on a horse. They'd ride horses up there and stay away. And I just got a message. My internet is unstable. I hope you can hear me. Um, oh, good. Good. And um, Oh, it's also a meeting site for Native American traders, too. So it's got history that goes way back. Uh, one of Phil's vineyard people uh, found a ceremonial stone point uh, um, that's about four or five inches long that dates back to, what, what does it date, date, date to? Two or 3,000 years ago, yeah. at, at least. So it does have a long, long history. Anyway. As we're redeveloping the vineyard, it's, it's really exciting now. We're finding the clones. We really like 337 because it's a little earlier ripener. It responds well to the site. Um, and we have uh, a nice block of Cabernet Franc coming along. We've used it in this, this wine and uh, replanted it since then. So it'll be even better. We have some uh, Malbec coming, which is a fabulous blender in terms of intense color and, and um, softer char characteristics. So this particular Stone Edge farm wine is 90, over 90% 90 from the Moon Mountain District. It varies from year to year because we have the vineyard down in the, um, down in the valley, this, the uh, Stone Edge vineyard, which is in the Sonoma Valley District. But in this particular year, um, we sourced almost all of this particular wine from the Moon Mountain District, and most of it came from um, this sil Silver Cloud Vineyard. You might note we've also planted a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. We want to make it sort of for fun, really. It's uh, a few hundred cases, but it's um, it's interesting to work, like was mentioned earlier, with high high mountain um, Sauvignon Blanc. You don't find that very often, and uh, so far, we're seeing great, great results from that vineyard too. So it's a work in progress, very excited about it. Uh, the culmination of kind of a long history that I've had in these, these mountains and, uh, and I just love it. And I, you know, I hope you love the wines. Now, the wine's beautiful and I've been up to your place and around there and a stunning views too from there. That's really quite an unbelievable place. Um, and the, yeah, the wine's beautiful, really rich, but I, you can really get that. I think the Cabernet Franc aromatics for, for folks who are following along and tasting the wines, um, really beautiful aromatics. And so we're going to move over to, to Cayman with Robert and Mark Harold. Robert, I think your vineyard might be, well, it's definitely one of the first vineyards I visited on Moon Mountain many years ago that started getting me really interested in this area because of its ruggedness, because of the personality of the wines. So tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about your story. What made you buy this property? I'm trying to show everyone here where it is. You know, it's amazing. Can you, see the, can you see the vineyard? Yeah, I'm gonna show two views. You know, one, your, your vineyard is actually one of the easier to get to, but here's came in a state here. Um, it's actually fairly easy to get to relative to some of your your colleagues. And then here I'm going to show the, um, the varietal breakdown in this and the blocks because you make some single block wines. So it's kind of interesting, I think, to, to see what your, what it looks like, what the ranch looks like. But what brought you here? Um, I had, uh, I had sold my first screenplay in 1979. 
And uh, a friend of mine, uh, I called all my friends and said, uh, I have a check from Warner Brothers that's negotiable. Uh, <laughs> you know, drugs and alcohol are on me. So um, uh, this guy invited me up here and he took me to this property. I don't know why. Uh, we walked for an hour and a half straight up through a whole bunch of trees, got to the top. And this was, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, we have a view of the whole San Francisco Bay from here. Um, spent the whole day getting high on pot that Phil Katuri grew. And um, at the end of the day, I uh, said, Michael, I could stay here forever. You said you can't, it's for sale. And I bought it. That's what brought me up here. Uh, this basically, this whole webcast is a paid political announcement for Phil Katuri's vineyard business. <laughs> so anybody out there who Unpaid. wants to uh, plant a vineyard or buy a vineyard, as the Lassiters have found out, he's like the tar baby. You get close enough, you stick, and you can't get off. <laughs> Hopefully it's well. <laughs> Robert, he's, he's Italian. He's Italian. You got to understand that. He's a salesman. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, anyway. Actually, I'm going to leave think, the room. Uh, I think ours was, I think this was the first vineyard uh, you came up to see. Um, you had just started uh, your organization and we took you out to the lava block. Yeah, it was and we exactly. walked around there with Phil. I think it was the first time yeah. you were up here. Um, yeah. What drew me here was the view. I didn't know anything about this, um, but Phil did. He knew a little bit more than I did. And uh, we like to call my place the laboratory uh, because this is where he really put all these concepts and ideas and theories he had about organic viticulture in the mountains to, uh, to the test. He really just started doing it. He, he built the entire thing. Um, I had a great passion for wine. I had really no idea what I was getting into. Before I knew it, I was up to my knees in sinking, um, mostly in his bills, but uh, in a passion for growing wine. I didn't realize how unique my place was or this area, these, the people we've had on this, until we had a fire in 1996 uh, that PG&E caused, of course. And I had been farming at that point. We'd been farming, what, for 15 years, Phil? Yeah, yes. 15 years. And uh, these people came up and they wanted to offer me $400 a ton for two years worth of growth. At the time I was selling my grapes to Dick Arrowwood for 2,300 bucks a ton. And it takes five years to get a decent crop off the vines. They are unmoved. Uh, I found a lawyer who um, just papered them to death. Um, they, um, they sent a bunch of experts up here to prove that this was not worth anything. Everybody who came up came from Napa, of course, and they either wanted to buy the fruit or they wanted me to hire them to make wine. And it's the first time I really understood the potential of my place and by extension, the places that move over from me going that away, going east and north. And we started making wine and the wines were they were exactly what you would expect. They were spectacular. This is our 20th vintage up here. Uh, yeah. And um, every year is a total surprise about how interesting and unique the, the wines made in this specific area are. Plus, it doesn't hurt, and here we go again, Phil, it doesn't hurt that we have somebody who is so deeply committed to the viticulture. You can make bad wine out of good grapes. You cannot make good wine out of bad grapes. Mm -hmm. And Phil Kajuri does not grow bad grapes because he's committed to site. He's committed to the these mountains and to these soils and he just works the magic. Um, and that's it. And Antonio, you've been up here three, four times now and walk around and it's just, it's always the same. It is always the same, but you know, the, it's always the same to you, but for someone like me who only gets to 
who's only been there three or four times, every time you discover some new nuance, you, you know, you maybe take a look at the a parcel a different way, an orientation a different way. But, you know, that's how these maps have been built. These maps have been built on, on visits. And we've, Alessandro and I have been to all of these vineyards, many of them more than once, but and some of them, many, that's, and the, the important vineyards, the reference point vineyards, many, many times more than once. And we're, you know, we're still not done. So, um, well, they're just, extraordinarily detailed, which I think is amazing. Well, that, that's the most important part in, in winemaking and grape growing is attention to detail. And as has been alluded, you don't, you don't go into a hillside, a mountain vineyard like this and harvest the whole thing in one day. If you look at the harvest dates uh, of all these wines that we've tasted, they go over, they stretch out over 10, 10 to 12 to 14 days from when we started the harvest to the finish. So able to take apart the parts and then, and then assemble them. You know, honestly, watching this, uh, this webcast, um, I think um, Jim and Mac and John and Nancy, I think we should all get together and collectively negotiate a price with Phil. Because united we stand, divided we get charged. <laughs> so, so dinner's at my place tomorrow. Well, your, your, your cost just went up, Robert. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Phil also happens to be my neighbor. I mean, we we eat dinner three nights a week together. So, uh, but I can't say enough about it. You can have a viticultural area like this, Antonio, and not exploit it the way it's been exploited in the best sense of the word. Uh, Phil has managed to exploit it in the best sense of the word. He has a sensitivity towards the topography towards what is needed on each individual vineyard to produce the healthiest and the best fruit. It's, uh, and it's all in the fruit. I mean, wine is all about what's grown. Great. Well, so That's it. let's, um, you, you also have a pretty talented winemaker though. Yeah, so. can we hear from Mark, oh, yeah. please? And, and then, then there's Mark. <laughs> yeah, there's, I wanna hear from Mark. So well, this is the wine. Hi, Mark. Hi, I'm Cameron uh, so, you know, in 2017, so I'd love to hear from, from Mark. I love the ingredients on the back. It says ing ingredients, organic grapes. That's it. Um, but I'd love to hear from Mark, Harold, the philosophy of making the wines from this site and how you approach, how you approach it. Mark, well, um, I, I cut my teeth on uh, Napa Valley grapes, so I guess I'm an outlier. Um, and I came into this in um, mid 2000s, 2004, and 2003. Two. Two. <laughs> okay, but who's counting? Who's counting? And what I saw was a quality that was um, similar, or if not better, than Napa. And I think um, if I were to summarize it, it's a testament to uh, volcanic soils, elevation. Um, and exposure. Antonio, what Mark said to me when he first came, uh, came over here to look at the vineyard, he said he didn't understand why somebody would put a, say that if uh, somebody would put a geographical line on a geological map and say that you could grow better grapes on one side than the other. You're referring to Mount Veter and Moon Mountain, presumably? Yeah, that's it's yeah. what he said. He said he came over, he said he wanted he saw the sites, he saw the area. He said, I, I want to make Cabernets as good, if not better, than they make in Napa without the marketing. He said, I just want to make great wines, and there's no reason because there's a line on a map that the wine is better on that side or this side. It's a geological formation. And that's yeah. where we started, honestly. Well, that's right. That's where I, we started too, because the first map that we did, I don't know if I ever showed it to you, but it's Mount, it's Moon Mountain and Mount Veter on us on one sheet, you right. know, going to probably annoy a lot of people, but that's how this whole thing started. The whole thing started is why is there this line in this middle of this mountain? Right. And we want to understand that. So that's how I got to you in the first place. But I'm curious because Mark, who, who, who makes the pick calls, Mark? Because you like to pick much later than most people, but I know you're going to tell me you like to pick when it's, when it's ripe, but <laughs> you know, obviously various views on that. So how do you come to like a consensus? Because like you're like a month later 
than everybody else. At least. Whatever Mark wants, we do. You know, the grape, the grape tells me when, when, when they're ready. <laughs> so Phil and I go out every, um, every block has a, has a different siren call. Um, so there's, um, there's an optimum time to pick. And I guess it's um, um, very, very uh, subjective, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, we have a ton of questions. We're going to get to them in a second, but I realized that we didn't really, I skipped over Massimo Monticelli at Brion, and it would just be great if we could just go back real quick and just get a little bit of insight on how the wine is made because we, we, we sort of passed over that. So my apologies, but tell us a little bit about, about your wine and, and the philosophy around making it. Why can I say this already that hasn't already been said? I mean, great Hopefully grapes and great wine. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, uh, Nothing against uh, our panelists, but it's 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 really easy, and and, and actually I love the, the our, our vineyard is, is amazing because we have so many different blocks, so many different aspects. So I mean, we've got the red, we have Monterosso on our property, and we also have white ash, and we also have and depending which way the sun is and when we pick it, and and then we make we we make all the wines, and and it's 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 simple. It really is. I mean, I. I, I uh, Luckily, I don't have to do what my dad did. My dad works for Gallo, so again, he's uh, so I don't have to do any of that stuff. I, I work uh, with just the super, super duper premium of of, of, uh, of Moon Mountain, and it's just it's amazing what I get to do. Um, I remember when when Brian was first planting that vineyard, my brother and I were, were were actually literally dancing in in the vineyard, going like, "We're gonna make good wine. We're gonna make good wine." <laughs> it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, and it's we keep making better and better wine. Fantastic. Um, well, that's great. Well, let's, let's thank you for that. Um, let's get to some of the questions. We have some, some incredible questions. I will try to answer them as many as we can. Um, what is the, so Lisa asks, what's the lowest elevation in Moon Mountain? Does it have a, does it have a, an altitude that it starts? Uh, the Southern part of the district starts at 400. As you get to the North, it starts at 300 foot elevation. And that's here. This is where it starts here. Yeah, so right there is that 400 feet. As further north you go, it goes it goes up to 300. And they're down to 300 feet, and all done all based on the soil types. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, I'm looking through the comments. I mean, it looks like you guys have a ton of fans. So there's a lot of great comments here. Um, some David is uh, David Forbes is enjoying the 2012 Reprise Moon Mountain Cabernet Franc. For example, somebody else is drinking 2010 Mourvedre from Repri. Um, so that's pretty cool. 2015 Stone Edge Farm Cabernet, 2016 Repri Jennifer Block. Um, did you guys like say to like your list, like open your wines and come and open them with us? <laughs> People have opened really nice wines. Um, enthusiastic. We like enthusiastic followers. Let's see. Um, Dan, thank you for the comments on the maps. A, a few people, there's a few comments on the maps. So this is like a very close to being done map, but it's not quite published yet. It'll be published with a front and a back um, in paper. And, you know, we're still figuring out the electronic side of that. But, you know, these are not files that we just sort of email. A few people have asked for that. And generally we don't really do that, but we're happy to show them in print, in a poster size or a folded size. Um, so here's a question for Brian. Um, he, John says, I know where to taste Brian's wines because his place is at the end of my street, but where can I taste the others? So it'd be nice to hear real quick from everyone, where, um, where, can, where, where can people go to taste your wines? Where can the public go? Well, for the Lasseter Family Winery, you can come up to Glen Allen. We are, um, we have a beautiful tasting room and it was voted as the most elegant tasting experience by the Vintners or Growers Association a few years ago. So our- um, It says it all. That's yeah. It. Yeah, Rick, Robert. And anyway, um, Antonio, you didn't hold up the Lasseter wine. I, uh, didn't. I don't know oh, if it's snobbery against Syrah, but look at this beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, my wife designed this label and it's beautiful. It's our single vineyard. And Trinity Ridge, so there's three mountains, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So it's the Trinity right there. And that's the right Valley there. of the Moon, Moon. Yeah, it's the Valley of the Moon. So. There it is. Okay, that's Lassiter. What about, Philip, 
your tasting room is in, in the town. Uh, our, tasting, our tasting room is in Sonoma, uh, Winery 16600, right down from the Red and Grape, a, a block off the plaza. And hopefully it will be back open soon. Yeah, right. Uh, we covered Brian. Moon Mountain Vineyard and Reprie, where would where where can people go to taste those wines? So we have two tasting rooms. There's the for Reprie, which is the estate winery. It's on the property, reservation only. Um, and then separately, we have two other brands which aren't weren't featured here, but we have a brand called Pangloss Cellars and a brand called Texture, both of which are served at a tasting room on the on the plaza. Okay. Uh, which, which I have to admit is one of the most beautiful tasting rooms on the nice you know in Sonoma. And everybody, please come because each of these tasting rooms are so incredibly special and unique. And it's not the cattle call thing. It's very private, very specialized. And, and you know, all of these wineries and the people who work at the wineries are so incredibly knowledgeable, special, really, really, um, I think, reflective of all the owners and the winemakers that you have here. And, and they're all anxious to get back to work. I yes. think we're all yeah okay. And John, cool. you might John, you might want to add that if you go over to Napa, not wanting to um, cast aspersion, and you go to the tasting rooms there, and you say we'd like to taste your you know the top of your line wines, they never have them. But if you come over here, <laughs> you can taste in all of our tasting rooms. You can taste our all high end wines all the time. And, and Robert's tasting room on the plaza is a beautiful small tasting room too. It's great. And he does pour, we all pour our top wines. It's really yeah. good. <clears throat> Which is hey, this is unusual. Yeah. We're very about proud of them. And oh, <laughs> what about, so we've covered, we've covered the, about, we've covered Phil's winery, we've covered BYs, we've covered. Stone Edge will be the next. Yeah, and Stone Edge is is we covered Lasseter. So where's Stone? Where can people go taste Stone Edge? Would you believe that we do not have a tasting room uh, by design, but we have a restaurant in downtown Sonoma called Edge uh, that's uh, open several times during the week, where we serve superfood and we like to show our wines opposite their French French counterparts. So you can uh, get our wine. Uh, you can take, you can buy it there, but it's not technically a, a tasting room. It's a restaurant, and it's called Edge. And the food is fantastic. In insane, insanely great. Yes, I will. Thank fantastic. you. It's a fantastic. Hey, say this is this is Brian. Um, our tasting room is in Kenwood. We have a tasting room in Kenwood where we uh, taste all of our wines, but also we taste up here at the a state where we taste in the cave. And not only do we taste the current releases, but we also taste the uh, past wines that are in the library, so. That's a great opportunity, right? Obviously. And Robert, your tasting room is in, in Sonoma Square also, right? Yeah, we have a tasting room out in, uh, on the square and um, we schlep people up the up the mountain, we have a what we call a sky deck, where you can just lounge around on couches, look at the view. I come out and visit with everybody who comes to taste up here because it's a very convenient way to avoid writing, um, which is mostly what writing's about. And uh, you just sit up here and hang out at the vineyard. <laughs> so it's all very casual. He offers autographs too. Autographs not as all day long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's a question from Norman. What is a reference point vineyard? So that's, I, I guess, for me, what, what I mean by that is a vineyard that has an established track record in a region and that people look to when they think of a place. So when you think of Moon Mountain, I do think you think of Monterosso, you think of Fredericks, maybe you think <clears throat> of no, the original Kistler vineyard, Montecillo, and more recently came in and, and vineyards that we're talking about today, which are a little bit younger, uh, but those are <coughs> more modern points. And it's the same thing if you, you know, I don't know if you, well, I mean, Phil, Phil was talking about Coombsville. So if you think about Coombsville, it would be Caldwell, it would be Meteor, et cetera. So there's sort of the, the flagship benchmarks 
for each region and each appellation. That's what I mean when I say uh, reference point. So let's see, a lot of really positive comments here. I think you guys can see. Um, I think Jim's uh, vineyard up at Repri is a great reference point because it's been around for so long. Yeah. Um, so yeah, exactly. True, also Repri also. Um, question for Mark, when did you pick the grapes for the 2017 Cayman? Last week. <laughs> <laughs> right before the fires. <laughs> they, they, really they were <laughs> I had the harvest dates, they, we, we picked on October 4th. The rest was going to be picked on October 8th, but we started that year on September 17th. Right before Robert's birthday. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a little bit of a question about the, the display sizes of people. And, and so one of the um, issues with the technology is if, if you want to show something like a map, you know, we're sort of, cons we're obligated to have this the speaker thumbnails be be small. I don't know that there's really a way to get around that, but that's kind of why we opted for this. Uh, so, but now the map's gone. So some Be Becky asks, the Lassiters will be happy. Be Becky asks me to show the Trinity Ridge label. So it doesn't it doesn't really say that, I guess, on the anywhere in the in the bottle, but this is the Lassiter wine. So that's for you, Becky. John and so, Nancy, not only did you get voted coolest tasting room, I think you have the coolest label. Oh, uh, thank you. That's a very cool label. It's her. It's her. She's the <laughs> thank you. That's graphic design. It's a story in it. You Where's know, Robert, my free case of wine? Storyteller. We we kind of uh, love love telling stories, and we try to get storytelling within you know our our winery. In our each of our wines has a story behind it, and so in this label has a real story to it. So, uh, but. These wines, we've been tasting them as well, and they, everybody, they're, they are spectacular. Dude, give them all another pass. Man, it's really they fun. are really spectacular, everybody. <laughs> well done. I mean, this is amazing group of wines. I'm very so, honored to be a part, you know, a part of. Yeah, I'm, I'm done <laughs> working for the day, so I'm not spitting in a, into a bucket. <laughs> I'm Mountain wines yeah. in particular respond really well to air, but. Um, if I can ha hang on to everybody for a few minutes, there's a couple really, I think, fascinating questions that would be great to capture. Uh, one is from Keith and Beth who ask, what's it like to farm grapes in Moon Mountain versus something like Sonoma or Napa Valley? And I think we should talk about Sonoma Valley since it is the, um, the, 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 the one of the um, uh, regions that, that, that sort of moves up into Moon Mountain. So Phil, what is the difference or is there a meaningful difference between Moon Mountain and then the vineyards that are just adjacent on the valley floor of what we call here the central corridor of Sonoma Valley? Well, the, the, the main thing is when you're driving a tractor, you can't fall asleep because the, uh, it's, it's not level, it's not flat. Uh, and and every, every, every 15 feet, there's another rock you're going to run into. Uh, hillside farming, is a, it's, a, it's a different culture altogether. All um, because as you go down a row, you're subjected to different, different views, uh, different soil types. Uh, as I look at, you know, the, the, all the clients here that I work with, that there's not, there's no uniformity of soils in any of these vineyards that we're tasting the wines from, but we're, what we're tasting, the tasting in uniform, uniformity of an, of an area within Moon Mountain District. And as, as you get down into the valley, there's this, there was more homogenous and you get a single flavor and it's great to be able to sit down in the same vintage and taste a valley grown Cabernet, a valley grown Syrah alongside a, a hillside of mountain grown grapes. And then you can see what the difference is. Hey, Phil, if you remember th this ABA st really, we batted around for several years, but it's current iteration started with uh, myself, Eric and Phil talking, addressing that question. We kept saying the wines we're making up here are so profoundly different than the wines that are being produced in the valley. We should really try to segregate ourselves and separate ourselves. Um, and uh, of course, none of us have organizational skills. So we went to Jim and, and of course he handed it off to somebody who had organizational skills 
But it those conversations started because we kept saying, you know, we have not a lot in common with the, the wines that are being grown in the valley, and we should try to differentiate ourselves. And I think we were, uh, uh, than, uh, we were drinking a 47 Bourgogne, if my memory serves me correctly when we had that conversation, Robert. At what was that, Eric? 47 Bourgogne we were drinking. Yeah, yeah, and probably seven other different wines, but <laughs> um, but we, we, we first started talking about it that way in a serious way because we were seeing the differentiations. And then, I mean, look, John and Nancy came here and they bought a property just based on the fact that the wines are so different. They have wines down in, in the valley. They have wines up here. And the wines are so profoundly different that they went ahead and bought a whole property, which God bless you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so let's take a few more questions. Phil has had a very nice evening because he started with the 2015 Cayman, not drinking 2016 BYs. Um, question though is, are the tasting rooms open yet? And if not, what is the outlook for that? Tasting rooms are not open yet. Uh, hopefully, well, tasting rooms that are associated with, with, with the selling food are um, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks, it's going to occur. I think a lot of us here are working on ways that we could do social distancing and having uh, setting up tables outside. Uh, and hopefully it'll be coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Robert is inventing a mask that you can drink wine through. <laughs> and that is um, go through testing. <laughs> the, 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 all the tasting rooms will be open. Call the straw. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was just scrolling through here. We had some incredible, a lot of really positive comments. Obviously, you guys have a lot of fans just um, uh, looking. I just want to. I just want to say one thing that that as as we open up and you guys come, you know, I think every single one of these tasting rooms in these vintners will be happy to take you up onto the properties. I cannot stress enough how the views are so spectacular on the Moon Mountain District. It's some of the best in all of the wine countries all over the world. The best sunset views, for sure. Unbelievable, the views. I mean, you know, Robert's been showing us the views from his place. But, you know, on the back of Phil's um, bottle, it says, Grapes with a View, Wine with a Vision, and it, which is so appropriate for his wine and his farming, but I think it really represents the, the whole district because it yeah, is good one point. of the most stunning places on the, the planet, everybody. And, and it's making some of the best wines in the world, the best wines in California, hands down. And, uh, but also it's just the greatest people here, you know, and we just love each other too. And, and everybody, when we started our winery, we, it was unbelievable how much how many of uh, our friends who had wineries said, what can I do to help? Everybody's there to help you. Because unlike so many other businesses, it's not a competition because if someone has a great success, every, everybody benefits from it. You know, I think one of my favorite stories in all of Sonoma Valley was when there was the fire in the Carmenet right. vineyards were hit so badly. And it yeah. was during harvest season that all the, all the wineries and all the vineyards just started showing up to their winery with trucks of grapes and giving it to them so that they can have a vintage that year. And they created one of the greatest wines I've ever tasted. It's called Fire on the Mountain. <laughs> and it was so emotional and so special. And it was typical Sonoma that, that yeah. everybody turned up to help without, without asking. And that's what Sonoma is about. It's about really just helping each other and I think it's like the fires, it's the COVID, everything. It's just amazing what this whole group does to help. help. Together. Is Sonoma Strong. Hashtag is Sonoma Strong is, is a real thing. Well, it's, I mean, that's, I think, a great way to wrap up. Uh, such a positive message. I've always enjoyed spending time in your, in your area and um, visiting the vineyards, tasting the wines. I want to thank all of you for your time tonight. This is by far the, the, the most comprehensive of these, of these webinars or virtual tastings or 
whatever you want to call them, panel discussions that we've had. The questions were amazing. The audience participation is amazing. And uh, it was just a tremendous privilege to be able to share this time with you, to taste your wines, and also to show the work that we've done mapping your vineyards. So I'm going to have a glass of wine and toast you. So I just want to thank everybody for watching. Thanks for thank your you. questions. Thank you. All the winemakers who share the wines with us and their owners. And thanks so much. And uh, can't wait to do this again. Plenty to explore. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.